All right, welcome everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started since it is four o'clock, um, but uh, or four o'clock central. Um, but uh, so first of all, thank you so much for coming um, to our second nationwide event focused on health and safety at our schools. Uh, so um, my name is Denise Archibald. Um, I'm an admission specialist here at Guidepost Montessori. And so uh, just before we get started, our goal here today is to really offer all of you all um, a solid understanding of what safety measures um, are in place at our schools right now so that you are fully equipped to make um, an informed decision regarding enrollment um, at our campuses. So we want to provide you with as much information as possible about the safety measures we have in place and provide you all with um, some space to ask any questions about the choices we have available, um, not only at our brick and mortar campuses, but also virtually and in home as well. So uh, just to do a brief agenda, uh, overview of our agenda, um, I'll be introducing our presenters momentarily, uh, and then we're going to dive into a video of our current health and safety practices um, and showcase a video um, in a day in the life of one of our students who um, is currently attending one of our campuses. Uh, and because several of our families, um, several of the families attending this call uh, have never visited one of our campuses, I'm also going to take a moment to talk a little bit more about our prepared environment and how our schools and our classroom setups are really set up to be conducive to social distancing and um, independent instruction. And I'm going to talk through some of our practical life activities. Again, I know there are lots of families here who um, are new to, to the Montessori approach and then also new to um, our Guidepost Montessori overall. So I'll talk through some of the practical life activities that we have in place to really support health and hygiene in our classrooms. And finally, we'll answer some of the questions that were emailed to us in advance um, as we open it up for a general Q&A session uh, with our facilitators, uh, Michelle Sutton, Jessica Hobbs, and Matt Bateman, who I will introduce now. Uh, so as I mentioned before, my name is Denise Archibald. I'm uh, an admission specialist here at Guidepost Montessori. Um, again, as I mentioned before, I know that we have both existing families as well as prospective families on this call. So uh, I will be providing a brief overview of our school and programs um, for those of you who are not currently enrolled at one of our campuses. Um, I'm also available to answer um, any general questions about our admissions process. Uh, and then I'm also a, a parent, so I happen to be a parent of a five-month-old who's currently enrolled in our NEDO program at our West Loop campus in Chicago. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have about um, our schools as a parent as well. Uh, we also have Jessica Hobbs here from our compliance team, and she's here to answer your specific questions about um, the safety measures in place and how our team is staying on top of the changing landscape of government regulations and informing schools of any updates and changes that take place. Um, we also have here Michelle Sutton, who is our Senior Director of Training, uh, and she's responsible for communicating all of the safety measures we have in place um, to campus leadership teams. And then finally, we also have Matt Bateman, who's our uh, Vice President of Pedagogy on this call to, uh, to offer some additional perspectives on our health and safety measures uh, and the, the approach that we've taken at our campuses. Um, on this call, we also have um, quite a few other members of our, um, of our team who are available to answer any questions you may have um, on the chat uh, feature of this call. So if you do have any specific questions that arise throughout the presentation, um, our team members will be jumping in to, to help answer those questions via chat. And you can tell who's a member of our team, just they'll have um, guidepost in parentheses, just so you can distinguish between who's a guidepost um, uh, staff member and then who's I'm um, just or who's uh, another family member but uh, basically we're going to be um, leaving some time at the end as well to address any questions that you have so if you do have questions that don't get answered via the chat um, initially we'll be sure to bring them up um, at the end so with that being said we'll go ahead and get started so just to tell you a little bit more about Guidepost Montessori. Uh, so Guidepost Montessori is a lot of things. We're, we're a network of Montessori schools. Um, we are a community of Montessori parents and educators. And um, we're also, um, as a result of this pandemic, we're a growing encyclopedia of Montessori um, resources. So we offer virtual and at-home and self-serve Montessori programming. 
um, which I'll talk about all of these different options at the, um, at the end of this presentation as well. Uh, but essentially our goal at Guidepost Montessori is to make high quality Montessori education available to as many children as we can. Uh, so our home office is based in Lake Forest, California, but as you can see um, through this map, we've got campuses across the nation. We are the largest network of mon private Montessori schools in the United States. And at this point, we're actually on track towards expanding to over 70 schools this year located, located around the world. And our mission is to mainstream and modernize the Montessori approach of fostering independence and developing human beings. So um, you can see that we, um, you know, we are located globally. And, um, and as a result of the pandemic, we, we actually have um, extended our reach um, through our virtual programs as well um, to countries all over the world. Now, uh, Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had to heighten our health and safety procedures to keep our environments as safe as possible for the entire community. And um, I am going to show a video momentarily just um, of a day in the life of one of our students who is currently enrolled at one of our campuses. Um, but just to provide you with um, a brief overview of some of the practices that we're um, implementing across the board and in all of our campuses. Um, so we are uh, limiting classroom sizes, um, generally uh, with groups of 10, including a guide, um, but this does vary based on state guidelines. Um, we're limiting access to open spaces and high traffic areas, so we're only allowing children and staff members to enter the classrooms um, to limit any risks of uh, cross-contamination. We're also ensuring that children are staying within pods, so we're limiting the overlap um, of classroom groups, so children are remaining with, the, with their specific classrooms in a pod for the entire day. And we're also conducting regular temperature checks um, for all adults um, that, may uh, that may enter the building, so like repairmen, staff members, um, as well as children. And, uh, and finally, we're also doing some regular deep cleanings as well. So it's really important for our classrooms to be as self-contained as possible, but um, we also wanna make sure that we're um, cleaning um, our classrooms thoroughly throughout the day, as well as um, on a weekly basis, just to ensure that um, we're limiting any cross-contamination um, within classrooms or um, throughout the building. All of our staff members wear face masks, face masks at all times, um, even if it's not required by the state. And, um, and so we do, uh, we're actually going to have, um, uh, Jessica Hobbs is uh, going to actually cover face masks uh, specifically, just because it is a question that we know comes up quite frequently. So she'll be talking a little bit more after we watch this video um, about our, our policies and our, um, and our perspectives on the use of face masks. So. With that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, show this video, uh, which does share just all of the different COVID-19 uh, measures and procedures that we've been taking um, since, uh, since the beginning of uh, the pandemic. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have heightened our health and safety procedures. These measures help us to promote social distancing and contain and minimize the spread of disease. Upon arrival in the morning, your administrator will greet you at the door, do a temperature check, go over a wellness check, and sanitize all belongings with EPA approved disinfectant. Then they will escort your child to their classroom where they will change from outside to inside shoes. In preparation for your child's arrival, your guide will disinfect all high traffic areas and be ready to welcome them with a smile and escort them to go wash their hands for at least 20 seconds. At least three times a I just saw that there's an echo. Let me go ahead and try to address that. Today, our guides will wipe down high traffic areas such as doorknobs, tables, light switches with EPA approved disinfectants. Children will remain in their group without any mixing of groups at the beginning or end of the day. 
The best way to minimize exposure among our small groups and preserve our containment efforts is through consistent, responsible use of face coverings. All staff members should wear a face covering at all times. Face coverings should be washed daily, or a new one should be worn each day. In regards to face coverings for children, Guidepost Montessori follows CDC guidance and state regulations. Your child will never wear a face mask during nap time, while eating, or playing outside on the playground. During our playground times, each classroom will come out separately onto the playground for playground use. Between those times, the face mask can be removed while the children are on the playground, and as the children go back into the classroom, a guide will disinfect the playground with EPA-approved disinfectants. During nap time, we ensure that cots are spread at least six feet apart where possible. In states where face masks are required, children will not sleep with their face masks on. For end of the day pickup, an administrator or a guide will help your child gather their belongings and escort them to the front of the building. During these uncertain times, we would love to partner with you as parents, provide you with resources and the latest information so that you can make the best decision for your family and your child. All right, sorry about that. Um, if you do, uh, I know there was a bit of an echo initially. So um, if you do want to rewatch the video um, or if you want to show it uh, to your partner, um, there's actually a link to our health and safety page on our main website, um, which you can actually um, see a ton of information about not only, um, not only the video again, but you can also see a ton of information just about our general practices um, nationwide. So, with that being said, I'm actually going to go ahead and let Jessica Hobbs and Michelle Sutton um, speak a little bit more about how our team of experts is constantly monitoring government regulations enforce and enforcing uh, those regulations at the school level. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and let Jessica and Michelle take it away. Thank you, Denise. And I just want to say hello to everyone. Um, and thanks for being here. I do, I appreciate your concern for your child and family, and hopefully this will give you some answers um, to help you make the best decision for your family. Uh, like Denise said, um, my team does ongoing compliance for the schools, so we provide support for both compliance and health and safety. Um, to start with, I want to refer back to the video. Uh, I think the video displays uh, the very thoughtful and intentional approach that Guidepost has had to the health and safety for our schools during this time. Um, and to give you a little bit of a background of how that approach was developed, we can go back to March when all of this started. Um, our schools did close down for a bit, but it was for a very short time. And we immediately opened up for emergency care for essential workers. Um, so I think this has given us somewhat of an advantage because we've been in this for several months now and working um, through this landscape right now. Um, what we have learned is it's a very fluid situation. Uh, we don't always have the answers, but we are willing to change as we learn more. So the compliance team continues to research each week and provide update, updated changes um, on orders, recommendations from the CDC, from state child care agencies, from state health departments, and local health departments. We provide this information to our campuses on a weekly basis. It's rolled out to our campuses in two ways. One is through um, a living health and safety procedures document. So the document is updated weekly and sent out to our campuses. 
The other way is through real time, through a real time chat that we are able, the compliance team, if we learn information um, that changes need to immediately happen, then that can get to our campuses in real time. And in turn, our campuses uh, can ask questions about that information of what is the best way to implement this on our campus and how does this affect our staff and our children. So let's move on to what our goals are for health and safety. Our goal is to reduce the risk of in-school transmission with heightened health and safety procedures and the containment of groups. So what we do understand is that we can't eliminate exposure or transmission. So our goal is to reduce exposure with the heightened health and safety procedures. Uh, the video displayed children and well, I don't, uh, children and staff coming to the door and having fever and symptom checks. So all of our children, all of our staff, and anyone entering the campus, um, their fever is checked. Uh, we do a symptom check. And it's not just for the individual. We are also asking about the family or anyone living within the household. Because what we have learned is early detection makes a huge difference. You also noticed all of our guides and administrators wearing masks or face coverings. Um, so they are required to wear face coverings during the day. And Denise mentioned that we have pods and or groups and our groups do not mix. So they are contained to one classroom. And that does include the guide staying with that one classroom for the week. Um, they do not mix in the mornings or in the afternoons, or even if they are going outdoors to the play area, there's only one group at a time outside. Um, and once that group leaves, then the playground equipment is disinfected before another group can come outside. So what if there is an exposure or a potential case? Guidepost has a team to assist campuses in responding to the COVID, to COVID exposures and potential positive cases. Um, so there, there is a team, a central team, that assists the campus with the possible exposures. They help to provide guidance on the actions, um, on communication, on contact tracing, and then if there were a positive case, that would um, also mean reporting to the local health department and state departments. I will say that um, Guidepost has been very successful using the heightened health and safety procedures. Um, we have over 60 campuses open in the United States, and at this point, we haven't had one positive um, COVID case amongst a child. We have only had four positive cases with guides. And what I'll say is with that, um, that shows that there was no spread. So the containment, um, the mask wearing, the symptom checking, early detection has been successful. And for that to be successful, we have to have transparent communication. Um, and our staff, our guides, our administration have done a great job of communicating to families and families communicating to the campuses to keep everyone safe. Michelle, I will let you talk about the training. Yeah, I'll just touch on this briefly, but we offer weekly training and ongoing support for our guides and our school leaders to help them understand and implement these health and safety procedures and really talk through scenarios that are coming up, um, help it make sense for sort of their geographic and just like their specific building, things like that. Um, so offer lots of ongoing training and support to help them implement all of these thoughtful policies. Our approach to face coverings. I know that um, 
this has a lot of questions have have come up about face coverings. So um, we do implement face coverings for all the staff, administrators, guides. We do require them to wear them during the day. Um, in all of our states, elementary, middle, and high school students are required to wear face coverings um, when indoors. Some states require guides to encourage younger children to wear face masks, and so we follow those state regulations. Um, we do understand that it is not feasible for some young children to wear face coverings. And sometimes, you know, we have to understand that it creates um, a less than an unsanitary conditions. So, you know, if the child is not able to safely wear the mask, um, then we would not choose for them to do that if it were being dropped on the floor or left in different places in the classroom. Mask will not be put on children under age two um, or worn while napping. And we do ask that everyone wash their mask daily or that they wear a new mask each day. Sorry about that. All right, thanks, Jessica um, and Michelle. So uh, as I mentioned, if you still have any additional questions, you can feel free to drop them in the chat. We are going to be saving um, a good chunk of time at the end to answer any additional questions that may come up. Um, but now uh, we're going to pivot and just talk, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to provide a really brief overview of the Montessori environment. Um, again, because we know we have some prospective families here as well as current families, um, but just a little bit of background about how the Montessori environment actually does lend itself perfectly towards maintaining really safe and healthy practices, um, just in the way that um, our, we give ownership over children to take agency over their own hygiene, um, as well as the way that our, um, our that our school campus layouts are, um, are presented. So the first thing that you're going to notice when you walk into any of our classrooms um, is that everything is at the child's level, including sinks and hand washing supplies. So we want to teach children how to really take ownership and agency over maintaining their own personal hygiene, instead of having to ask a guide or a teacher to, um, to help them wash their hands. Um, so that's why having these resources at their level is so important so they can continue to, to monitor and um, ensure that they're washing their hands um, frequently. Children in Montessori classrooms are also spending time during the work cycle uh, working either individually or um, in small groups. So uh, this is really, you know, even before um, COVID, this is a, a huge component of the Montessori approach. Um, it's, they're working individually and in small groups to promote focus and concentration and a customized learning approach. Um, and so these individual and small group lessons really lend themselves perfectly towards social distancing. Um, and again, it's a standard part of the Montessori uh, curriculum, so or Montessori classroom. So whenever, whenever this pandemic is over, um, it's not going to be a huge shift in the way we deliver instruction um, because this is how we've always delivered instruction and will continue to do so. Um, children are also creating designated workspaces with mats, which help minimize cross-contamination of materials. Um, and after materials have been placed back on shelves by students, our guides are constantly sanitizing materials throughout the day. Um, and then finally, we know that um, because students are not required to wear masks while um, they sleep, uh, we ensure that individual cots during nap time are placed at least six feet apart from one another, given that this is the time where um, they're not wearing face masks. Um, so we want to ensure that any time where children have to remove their masks, they are um, social distancing appropriately. Now, Maria Montessori um, once observed that children are happiest when they're engaged in real life ordinary activities. So they enjoy wiping down tables, sweeping floors, or washing hands. And so the practical life uh, area of a Montessori classroom really covers two main areas of development that we found are incredibly important, especially um, in, this, uh, in this pandemic age. So care of self and care of the environment. 
So each activity like washing dishes or mopping the floor is purposeful and helps to develop fine motor skills and concentration. And, and these meaningful activities really instill within a child a sense of responsibility. And so because we are intentionally teaching children how to take ownership over maintaining proper hygiene, we're also helping children develop these lifelong habits um, and memory and organization um, to continue these safe and healthy practices for the rest of their lives and not just during this period in time. So, these are just a few sample practical life activities that are built into the Montessori method, but also happen to contribute towards safe and healthy practices at our schools. Um, so children are taught to change into their indoor shoes before entering classrooms and changing into their outdoor shoes when going outside. Um, and because children are taught to do this independently, it becomes a habit. And beyond this, um, an additional measure we've taken is we're storing all the shoes um, and backpacks and items separately from one another in plastic bins, um, just so they don't touch, again, in an effort to reduce the risk of cross-contamination. Um, children, as I mentioned before, are also taught to wash their hands on their own. Um, so everything is at the child's height and easily accessible, which really allows them to self-monitor for when they do actually need to wash their hands. Uh, and we know that caring for self is extremely important. So children are going to get ready noses um, and they're going to you know, have to cough. And so um, when those events happen, we wanna make sure that they are taught how to, how to wipe their noses, wipe their faces, cover their mouths when coughing um, and, and teaching them that this is not only um, a way to take care of themselves, but a way to take care of their friends and part of grace and courtesy to ensure that we're protecting our friends from our germs. Um, and then finally, something as simple as mopping the floor. Um, it's so exciting for a child to really take ownership over caring for their environment um, and ensuring that there's minimal contaminants in the classroom. So, so children can, again, they feel um, the sense of agency and ownership over um, safe and healthy hygiene practices within their classrooms. So that's just um, a brief overview of the practical life activities um, in, uh, in our classrooms. But I did want to actually, it seems like, um, uh, give, hand it over to, to our Vice President of Pedagogy, Matt Bateman, um, to just um, comment, to, uh, uh, provide a few additional comments, um, perhaps in response to some of the questions that we've been receiving on the chats um, about just our philosophy and our practices um, overall. So I'll go ahead and, and hand it over to Matt now. Yeah, thanks. Lots of great questions in the chat. Um, I can't quite keep up, um, but um, um, hopefully, we'll, uh, if we don't get to them during this um, during this session, we will reach out afterwards, especially if we leave an email address or, or if it's obvious kind of who you are. Some of you, it's not obvious, it's just like John, but if you have a first name and last name, we'll kind of look you up and reach out afterwards. Um, just, just a big picture, um, and this echoes what Denise and Jessica already said. Um, obviously, we are opening, um, oh, my video is off. Obviously, we are we are opening um, our schools, which is itself, um, you know, not not what everybody is doing. It's not what everybody's arguing for. Um, our our view is that um, within the context of our schools and our stakeholders and our families, um, COVID is a manageable risk um, in general kind of in our schools. And what what that means is that we think that the risk of transmission in a school can be minimized and managed, not completely controlled. You can never completely eliminate it, as Jessica said. But um, you know, when um, when this pandemic first hit um, in in China in the winter, and then in the U.S. Um, in the late winter, early spring, and we shut down all of our schools, um, we didn't know that much about the pandemic. We didn't know how how it would affect children. We didn't know um, there there were many, many models of how it would spread, of fatality rates, of um, different, different demographic risk profiles. And we knew relatively little. We knew relatively little about treatment. Um, I remember there being debates, very intense debates, on like cable news over proper hand washing procedure. And some people thought that you should wash your hands with hot water for 20 seconds. And other people said, no, only hand sanitizer would work. And these were like medical professionals. These weren't kooks. Um, we, we still, there's still a lot we don't know. Um, but we're six, seven months into this, um, I guess about six months into this, we, we do know a lot more. We know that children are at lower risk. Um, we know that young children are at lower risk for transmission. 
Um, and we know that um, there are things that you can do in terms of social distancing, sanitary practices, and wearing masks that do seem to help quite a bit. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're constantly monitoring. There's dozens and dozens of um, studies being done constantly now on early childhood spread in schools now that schools are opening. So we're getting in more data all the time. We're revising our policies all the time. Um, but, you know, we're, we are taking the approach that this is, that, that school is really important um, for children. Um, that this is an important developmental time and that the risks are manageable and worthwhile kind of in comparison to the benefits. So that, I just wanted to kind of put that out there as our big picture approach. I'm assuming that if you're attending this webinar that you're either maybe not totally aligned with that, but at least open to that argument. Um, you know, there are gonna be particular people, particular staff members, particular families with different risk profiles that just aren't going to attend school until the pandemic has passed. And that's fine, we get it. Um, and we offer virtual and at home options for those families. Um, we try to be accommodating, but uh, there are a lot of benefits to school. And so we're really, really trying our best to make it as safe as possible. Um, and so that children can reap those benefits and families can reap those benefits. Um, so I just, that's the big, big point that I wanted to make. Um, I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions um, in the chat. I'm now a little bit behind, but I will start scrolling through and uh, we'll all start answering questions. So I think one question that I've seen um, come up quite a bit is just, um, so if, if a guide or um, a student Test positive for COVID. Um, so what are the what are the next steps? Yeah. So those those next steps. If if someone were to test positive, um, the admin does reach out to the central team, and we help them to to um, to interview the situation, interview the family, what's going on. Um, we also do the contact tracing. Hopefully with all of our containment um, protocols, then we have contained it to one classroom. But we definitely go through and ask all those questions about where that person has been. Um, do we just need to quarantine that one classroom for 14 days? For the most part, that has been true. Um, but we know that things can happen and that's why we do that interview process to make sure that the person hasn't been in contact with someone else to keep everyone safe. Um, and then I'm also seeing uh, just a question about um, the, the ratios and the number of children per class. Um, has that been adjusted? Um, and what, uh, in, in general, um, what is our policy in terms of um, the number of adults and students allowed in each classroom? Yeah, our ratios haven't changed um, for most of our classrooms. We it, it varies a little bit by um, by classroom and location. So um, in most of our classrooms, um, we think that there's adequate space. Our classrooms are already pretty generous space wise. They're not super cramped. Um, and a lot of the discussions around schools and early childhood centers, the kind of ratios and, and classroom density and hallway density that are, that are being considered are really not applicable to us. Um, our, our school communities and classrooms tend to be quite small. Um, some places that's not true. There are some places where the, where the classes are a little bit more cramped and we've made adjustments um, to, the, to the capacity. Um, and then there are other places where um, we're required um, by local regulations to, um, um, to reduce capacity and there we're, we're complying with those regulations. Um, a good question. There was a related question about um, um, what I just wanted to get, get this one out. What are the factors that go into a decision to close a school? Um, so we haven't since um, since we did the kind of initial closing of all of our schools in March. We haven't totally shut down a school, I, is that, that might not be true. We might've shut down one school briefly for a couple of days to do a deep clean after a positive COVID case. Um, we, we don't have a kind of set of definite metrics in place, but um, if, you know, there, we were very, very closely monitoring our schools in Southern Florida um, a few weeks ago. Um, the pandemic has taken a turn for the better there. That was also true in Georgia and Texas for a while. Um, New York is obviously a hot, you know, it's actually in pretty good shape now, but it was a hotspot for a long time. It was pretty bad. Um, 
in none of those places did we feel like we wanted to close unless we had to, but it was pretty close. And the things that we looked at were um, background case positivity rates, which vary according to how much people are testing, but um, also especially um, hospital utilization um, is an important one for us um, as hospitals fill up and hit capacity if capacity isn't added. I mean, the, the big scary thing, which um, came close to happening in New York and Southern Florida is that the health system just has a kind of breakdown. And then there are, there are kind of implications of that beyond COVID. Um, so we've kind of walked up to the line of um, thinking about closing, closing our schools for those reasons, but we haven't quite done it. And in both cases, the pandemic and hospitalization capacity took a turn for the better before, um, before we felt like we had to. Um, it's a really good question. Thanks, Matt. And then I also see another question um, or just another theme of questions about ventilation and filtration systems. Um, so what are, um, I guess, like what are the different um, types of uh, practices that Guidepost is implementing to, um, uh, to implement filtration uh, systems into schools? Matt, would you like to take that question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so we, I mean, for the most part, we're using our existing filtration systems, which are um, all connected to outside ventilation. So we don't have kind of internally circulating air at any of our schools. Um, and the vast majority of our classrooms also have windows and doors that direct that directly open to the outside um, where possible, which is most places, but not all places, um, you know, where it's less than 100 degrees outside and where ventilation is um, um, otherwise an issue, we isn't otherwise an issue, we, um, we keep the windows open and we keep the doors open to maximize ventilation. Um, there have been, there's one classroom that I know of where we felt like the ventilation was definitely inadequate. We are purchasing HEPA filters and looking into other solutions for that classroom. But um, yeah, I mean, in general, light, fresh air, um, space, these are all existing, fortunately, about big values of our schools. And so um, for the most part, we can just lean on our existing practices, but it's something that we're monitoring. Um, we're, we've looked into getting UV light filters for, for our ventilation systems and other HEPA filters, and we haven't done any of that yet, but um, it's something that we, we kind of continue to explore. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay getting some complaints in the chat about my audio. Um, let me tinker with my headphones for a second. Uh, so another question that I'm seeing come up a bit is just if there's a child who's, um, who comes to school with just mild symptoms, so a runny nose um, or mild cold symptoms, are they permitted to enter the classrooms or are they required to do 14, stay home for 14 days or 24 hours? Um, what's the guidance there? That's a really good question. And we do understand, you know, that young children have sniff, sniffles all, all the time, right, throughout the year. Um, so what we have done is, yes, if, if um, we do more, it's more of that interview process with the family of understanding um, if the child is is just has allergies and you know just a sniffle and allergies then we try to to be reasonable on those situations maybe they're asthmatic already um but we also we do have to look through there and there is times that we exclude um based on those symptoms that the child would be excluded uh it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a 14-day quarantine um so it would be more like 72 hours um, and then coming back symptom free and fever free. You're getting a great question from, I don't know what her real name is, but in Zoom it says Miss Sassy. <laughs> um, my biggest concern, I've not been able to see the classroom or meet the teacher. My 21 month old um, is starting, so I have to leave him at the door with complete strangers not knowing what's happening inside. So um, pick up and drop off are definitely modified. I mean, this is this is one of the um, one of the trade-offs that we're kind of embracing one side of on the pandemic um, front. Um, I have never observed in my six-month-old daughter's infant room, even though I am the VP of pedagogy for the organization and desperate to see what's going on. Um, um, we, we really are trying to minimize the adult presence in the classrooms. We are doing virtual meet and greets with the teacher. Um, so, so there are all sorts of ways that you can get in touch with the teacher, get to know what they're doing, 
Um, we're trying to be extra, extra good with um, sending photos home, sending videos home. We use this parent communication resource called Transparent Classroom, where we document all the things that your child does during the day. Um, for a toddler, that would include their whole daily routine, their, their feeds, their naps, everything, in addition to, the, um, to kind of what they're doing in the classroom. It's, it's, it's not the same as kind of being able to go into the classroom and see it. Um, and that, again, that's just the kind of reality that we're in right now. Um, so if you haven't had that experience yet um, um, with your teacher and you're enrolled, um, message somebody from Guidepost your email so we can kind of make sure that you get a chance to do a virtual meet and greet with your teacher if something has slipped through the cracks. Yeah, and Camille added this to the chat, but we can also do virtual tours and, you know, have you on FaceTime and walk through the classroom. Obviously, we're not going to do things that would disrupt the learning of children um, in their environment, but we can show you the inside of the classroom, things like that, that just feel a little bit more sort of um, in real time. And then um, I'm also seeing questions um, about flu vaccines. And I know Jessica just um, hopped in to, to answer that question, but given that flu season is coming up, um, so what are, um, what are we communicating to families about um, in general about the flu vaccine? Uh, yeah, um, and I think Matt had just answered this um, in the chat also. And at this time, we have not required flu vaccines. Um, but we can definitely, we definitely recommend them. Uh, and I think we just, you know, we do have to, to monitor the situation and we understand that it's a fluid situation and that we're learning more. So do we think, you know, this could possibly change then? Yes. Yes. And we're open, open to that. Fortunately, um, almost all, if not all of the practices that um, minimize transmission of COVID also minimize the transmission of other respiratory viruses like the flu. Um, what the epidemiologists that we're consulting with, um, I mean, their general view is that, look, COVID is pretty low risk for children and that's a blessing, um, but people don't take the flu seriously enough. And so, so one, one kind of upside of this whole situation from their perspective is that um, this helps with the flu. This will this will end up kind of having people um, take take kind of flu precautions more seriously. Um, we are strongly recommending to all of our families that they get a flu vaccine this year. There there are some issues, as there always are with the flu vaccine, around optimal timing um, to get it. Um, but um, we're not requiring it just yet. Um, I received a private message just asking, are we providing um, uh, personal protective equipment to um, our guides or are we asking them to provide it um, themselves? Yes, um, we are providing PPE to our guides and to our administrators. They are also welcome to use their own um, if they find something more comfortable. And I think, Jessica, you may have mentioned this earlier, but just another question that I just saw come up is, um, so uh, if there is a, if there is a student who, um, or a, any staff member contracts COVID, is it just the classroom that's notified or is it the whole school that's notified? Um, no, that is definitely part of the transparent communication. The whole school would be notified um, so that everyone can make the best decision for their family. And I also saw, Matt, you were, you were talking a little bit more about the, um, the transparent face masks um, and just um, our efforts to try to find um, masks that allow children to be able to see um, and learn language. Uh, so are you able to speak a little bit more about just the progress for finding and identifying some of those transparent masks? Yeah, this has been like an organizational priority and honestly my personal mission for uh, since the pandemic started. So um, children, um, almost all children in our early childhood programs are in their sensitive period for language. Um, it's a special developmental phase um, and part and they're, where they're acquiring language really quickly. And a significant part of that, especially for 
infants and toddlers is watching the mouths of people who are speaking. You can kind of see it in their eyes. They're kind of, they gravitate towards watching the mouths. Um, I'm not crazy about the fact that um, my daughter is going to a school where the teachers are wearing masks all day. So I, I mean, we would really love to be wearing um, transparent face masks. Masks. Um, if you have any recommendations, send them to me. I've tried like 10 or 12 different kinds. They all suck. Um, like they either fog up really quickly or they don't actually allow you to breathe because they're totally made of plastic with no cloth or they're breathable but you can't actually see through them or they're not actually safe. There's something significantly wrong with all the ones that I've tried. Um, I think I've actually got a bead on some that are okay. Um, so continuing to look, continuing to kind of um, search for an option. With personal protective equipment in COVID, the landscape is changing so quickly. Like it's gone from like masks and thermometers are price gouged to, to like, there's a zillion kinds that you can buy and um, we're still trying to navigate that. But um, yeah, hopefully we'll have a transparent mask solution too soon. Um, it's a good, it's a good and we question. have a few campuses that have been testing out different versions of it and we've been piloting them and there's one right now that's being piloted at one campus that is also looking promising. So it's certainly something that we have our eye to. Um, we're getting a question as to what, what do we, there's a kind of trust but verify system when it comes to COVID. Um, that, I mean, that's true um, for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but the thing that we do check every single day is the temperature of every single person that comes on the campus. Um, and we're kind of getting more strict about that, not less. Um, so we use infrared thermometers and all the children and all the adults that pick up and drop off. And um, that's, that's our kind of hard test. Um, um, there are also certain combinations of symptoms that would that would kind of raise eyebrows, but that I mean, it is the the thermometer check is the kind of um, one kind of medical measure that we're doing daily for every single person coming in and out of campus. I will also add that we do we require the campuses to do a midday temperature check, oh, yeah. um, just in case you know um, someone had fever reducing medications in the morning, um, and yeah. that's helpful too. And um, would you be able to speak a little bit more um, to uh, like the cleaning procedures, the classroom procedures, um, given that Montessori is just so hands-on, um, what are the, uh, the specific hands-on procedures that have been implemented to, to keep all of the materials sanitized throughout the day? Yes, um, so that, so that the cleaning procedures that we have in place are that we are requiring the guides to wipe down the high traffic areas three times a day within their classrooms. Um, and that includes door handles, you know, tabletops, um, toilet levers, uh, all those places. So they're wiped down with disinfectant three times a day. Um, at the end of the day, the rooms are disinfected and then a cleaning crew does come in to clean um, at night or in the late evening before the next day. Thanks, Jessica. And then um, I do see another question about um, just if a school is required to shut down um, temporarily, um, what's, um, what kind of, what happens with um, that type of closure? Um, so um, I guess how, um, how would we determine um, tuition fees? Michelle, would you like to answer that? Um, sure, I was just responding to a question um, in the chat. Can you repeat the question? Um, about tuition fees, if, if the school were to close down for an extended period of time, how would we handle tuition fees? Yeah, at this time, um, if classes are only shutting down for a few days and we have our online and virtual and at home options as substitutes, we're sort of continuing with our current tuition policies with our short-term closures in the event of a long-term closure. We have our reopen team that Jessica and I are both a part of and meets multiple times a week to address these issues. And if we ran into a case where there was um, going to be a longer-term closure, we would want to think, um, you know, come up with a policy that we thought was fair. 
um, in that situation. So when we had to shut down our schools in March, for example, we did not continue charging our families tuition since we were shutting down our schools at that point, didn't have a strong viable alternative and weren't sure when we would be able to fully reopen. Um, but at this time, since it's all been short-term closures, we've continued with our, um, with our tuition rates. And, um, and what is the long-term plan? So um, I guess how, and I know this is hard to forecast, but um, is the idea that these additional safety measures, are they going to continue indefinitely um, just for the year or how often are, are things, or is the situation being reevaluated? Yeah, I was just typing up an answer to that on the chat. Um, I mean, do you know when COVID is gonna be over? <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, we do reevaluate constantly and we've already changed our policies um, in kind of multiple ways many many times since the pandemic started uh, my sense right now there's there are, there are three or four vaccines right now that are both in kind of mid to late phase trials um, and um, production is being preemptively ramped up on them um, kind of before they're even ready just in case they turn out to be safe so that we have enough of it um, ready to go and the target that people are floating is January I really hope that that's true and that that works out. Um, we're not counting on it, and we're not obviously we're not in a position to make promises about it. We're not um, we're not in the medical industry. Um, um, I, I and these things are messy. Like we know from other pandemics, like SARS, that vaccines took way longer than people thought, even though there were initial promissory things. And um, um, you know, I, I mean, we're this is I think this is going to be with us at least for months. I think half a year to a year is, is pretty likely. Um, I think in five years, we will almost certainly be out of the woods on this one. Um, and kind of that's the range that we're, I mean, we're like, we, we are taking this as like something that we have to manage on an ongoing basis. And this is part of the reason why we're being pretty aggressive about keeping our schools open is that we don't think that it's feasible to kind of not have school um, for a year or two years or three years, which, which could easily happen if we kind of had the same stringent standards applied um, um, throughout. We really are trying to manage the risk in a way that's a reasonable trade-off with the massive benefits of school, given that we don't know when this is going to end. Yes, this is COVID specific. Yeah, sorry, I'm just getting that question in the chat. This is definitely COVID specific. I think that there, there are going to be things that um, that stay with us um, as a result of this, as a society. Um, you see this if you, if you like, if you travel in Asia, you'll see like there's temperature check points in airports and they're not even used most of the time, but they're like there if you need them. Um, you know, um, there's just like kind of more of a culture of face masks on, on public transportation. I suspect that some of those changes will be with us. Some of those changes might even be with us as policy, as policy things, but you know, I, our assumption is that when COVID has gone, all of our students are not wearing masks all the time. And um, you know, that, that there will be um, some sort of return to normalcy, even if there's some some minor policy changes that that, that stay with us. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Sorry, I misunderstood it originally. Uh, I actually see a question that um, looks like it uh, got lost in the chats. It wasn't answered yet, but um, just how are we determining that all schools are meeting the health and safety standards that we're putting in place? So I think um, one way to determine that is we do have regional directors that um, are, are checking in on our campuses on a regular basis, weekly, um, and they're doing it virtually so that they can also um, visually see what's going on um, in the background and then just in, in interviewing our campuses and reminding them of what needs to happen. Um, it's also very telling um, if there were more cases. <laughs> that's, you know, our cases have been very, re have been reduced, um, or not reduced, we just haven't had that many cases. Um, so that's one, one thing. But I think the regional directors are doing a great job of communicating and checking in on our campuses um, weekly. And then um, I see another question. Any thoughts on doing a combination combination of brick and mortar along with remote if um, some parents are still hesitant about doing a full day at school? I don't 
think, uh, I mean, we have, so we have, um, it's a good question. We, we have maybe, does, someone, does anybody actually definitively know the answer to this question before I just start talking? I have <laughs> okay. a little bit of an answer. Okay, I'm not ahead, sure Michelle. if it's yeah. better than what you have or not. Um, so the way I understood the question was a combination of bringing your child, for example, like some days to school and then keeping them home virtually other days. If that is incorrect, please speak up and so I answer the right question. Um, but we're not doing a combination right now because we don't think that that actually sort of mitigates the risk. We're really focused on sort of our health and safety procedures fall into two categories. One is sort of keeping outside germs outside and the other is really keeping each classroom self-contained and limiting the number of children that are in that room, the number of adults that go in that room. There's no sort of cross, potential cross-contamination across groups of children. So for that, if we were to have some children going back and forth from home to school um, and then having other children in that classroom on other days, that actually increases the risk. So at this point, so Matt, feel free to jump in or <laughs> change the answer, but we're having families either choose to send children to school so that then their child can be part of that sort of self-contained closed classroom pod or to stay home and be virtual and you know take advantage of the high quality offerings we have that way, but we wouldn't want um, children to kind of be hopping back and forth uh, between those options at this time because that would actually sort of open up the classroom to more potential children then. Yeah, um, I mean the one thing that I was going to say in addition to that is um, we have had a number of families and encourage families to um, kind of switch their enrollment status from in person to virtual or virtual or in person. I mean we, we understand that family situations change, health situations change, um, your kind of understand your judgment might change um, as to um, even if your circumstances don't change as to the risk profile and your needs as a family. And so um, if you need to go virtual because, you know, your elderly parents are going to be visiting and for an extended period of time or something like that, then go virtual. And if, um, and if, you're, in the, if, if you're in a different situation where you're, you've kind of decided like, no, like now is the time for school, um, you know, switch, switch your enrollment to, um, to a brick and mortar school. So we understand that there's going to be some back and forth um, it's just the kind of like at will constant um, swapping back and forth that Michelle was talking about that we think is, um, it kind of gives, it, I don't know if it's more dangerous, but it definitely, it gives the kind of illusion of um, of risk management. And, um, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, it is what it is. If you're going to school, you're going to school, basically. Um, And I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, there's one question that I saw that got lost um, at the top as well that somebody just pinged to the bottom. Um, so um, how do we see children interacting? I guess, um, are they social distancing outside on the playground or um, how are they interacting outside versus um, inside the classroom? Yeah, I think one of the things that we, we definitely understand that young children um, are social and it, it's nearly impossible for them to social distance, which is why we've focused more on our containment efforts um, within groups so that one, you know, the groups are not mixing, um, but that we're not constantly trying to keep young children away from each other. I mean, I would even add to that and say, um, you know, ch children, young children need often need physical contact with the staff um, like you know that this is especially in infants and toddlers but even in children's house um, it's not like no touching um, that would be young, young children aren't in a position to understand that and it would be horrible for them um, you wouldn't put them in that situation um, when adults are interacting with children physically you can have heightened protocols around like wash your hands before wash your hands after have sanitizer available um, there is extra cautiousness around that but um, in early childhood programs, we do assume that there's going to be some touching and we, um, you know, we do try to disinfect things, use sanitary procedures, um, check temperatures often, masks on the adults, space out the children and so far as we can, but it, it, it is, um, it's a fool's errand to, um, to think that you can have social distancing with two-year-olds and so um, to, 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 to have perfect social distancing. There are risks, like, I mean, this is, this is something that you should all think through um, at, you know, if you want to send your children to school, it is not risk-free. Like I said, we're minimizing transmission. We haven't had a case of in-school transmission, even though there, there's been some cases, a small number of cases in our schools, kind of from background community spread. Um, but um, this, is, this is not a risk-free endeavor, and people have to kind of be thoughtful about it.
Great. Well, thanks so much for all of the really fantastic questions. Um, I think it's so evident that there's a ton of thought and care that's been put in um, just from all of our families. Um, and also thanks so much for um, for Matt and Michelle and Jessica for being able to come in and, and provide some pretty candid answers um, to families. Uh, and we know that there are a lot of different viewpoints um, for all of our families and, and we respect your right to choose what you feel is best for your child and your family, whether that's keeping your child at home, enrolling with us or, or choosing one of our virtual or in-home or self-serve programs. We know that this is such a, um, such a huge decision and we wanna make sure that we're here and available to answer any questions you may have so that you feel fully comfortable um, with your decision. Um, if you are interested in finding out about any of our additional programs or options, you can find out all about our, our in-home programs, our virtual programs, or any of our brick and mortar campuses um, on our main website at, um, at guidepostmontessori.com. Um, or you can drop your information um, in the chat for us to follow up with you if you have any, um, any questions that haven't been answered today. Um, but we, we totally understand that, um, you know, we, we appreciate the time that you came to, to speak with us and to, to share your concerns. Um, and, and we wish you all the best and trust that all of you are gonna make the best decision um, that's right for your family. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, and we really appreciate all of, the, um, all of the questions and participation. Thank you all for your very, very thoughtful questions. There's a, people are, there's a barrage of private messages that I'm now getting in the chat since I said that I would catch up on everybody's private messages, but we will catch up. Um, um, it'll just take a little bit of time. Thanks everyone.